Hi, hey, everybody. You there, Tony? I'm here, Jeff. Good morning. Good. How are you? Good. Lead the way. Well, I, we were, this is a review session, so I guess we should uh, take questions. What do you think, Jeff? Of course. I have no... Uh, uh, only interest to hear what's uh, on uh, students' minds or questions. Uh, I think you, I don't know if you want to say something about uh, the hour exam. Uh, we, yeah. You and I have not discussed it, but you've thought about it. I've thought about it. So right. yeah, we'll discuss it uh, in the next few days. Um, there will be the, the midterm. So it's going to be a little clunky, uh, technologically speaking, but this is the way we're going to do it during COVID times. So the exam will be on a shared screen this time next exactly a week's time at 10 o'clock next week. I will share my screen. Your exam will be on the screen. You will do the exam in the class, the hour, 15 minutes, and then you will email it to me immediately afterwards. And you'll get maybe five to 10 minutes grace period to email it to me. And then we will grade it and have it back to you the next, the next week. Um, it will be basically what we've talked about in class. Uh, there shouldn't be too many. There shouldn't be surprises. If you've followed the class and done the readings, you should do well. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, yeah. Um, and we would. Yeah. So that's pretty much what I want to say about the midterm. Not, it'll be short. It'll be one hour, 15 minutes. It'll be within the class. The, I believe the final will be longer because we have a, the way Fordham works. As you know, there are special times for finals, but midterms are done within class. So we will do that. Uh, okay. Uh, well, Professor Sachs is here this morning for a special review session, so we don't want to waste his time. So let's have a discussion. Anybody, um, anybody want to start it off? Because I, neither of us have anything prepared, so it's up to you. Don't make this the shortest class ever. Or do. <laughs> <laughs> James. Um, can you talk a little bit about the format? Is it going to be an essay or, or how do you plan on structuring it? It'll be a mix. Um, it won't be an essay. It'll be a sequence of questions, um, maybe some problems, maybe some more essay styles, but it'll be designed to fit, fit within an hour. So it's, it won't be just, it won't be like the assignment where there's just one essay. Thank you. Yeah, definitely uh, some identification names, concepts, uh, things from the readings, statements to uh, um, respond to who might have said so-and-so. Uh, it would be a nice uh, way to do things, a series of quotations, uh, things like that. But it's a mystery for me. We haven't written it yet. So right. I, think, I think it's the right, or I haven't at least. <laughs> so it's, I think it's the right answer uh, that it will be, uh, some combination of quick identification, short explanations, uh, maybe a couple paragraphs on one question, but an hour and a half goes fast. Right. Um, th this isn't a review question really, um, Jeff and Tony, but um, we, you covered a lot of ground, but you probably left out some things because you didn't have all the time in the world. Does anything come up for you that you might have said in the last, uh, how many weeks it is now, five, six weeks or something like that, or any particular author, theme, or topic that you felt you didn't have time for? Well, let, let me uh, say something about this. We're uh, trying to give a um, kind of a philosophical and ethical view about, uh, about economics as a field of inquiry and about the economy. And a number of the classes coming up will be empirical. We haven't really spent that much time on the data right now, but we will. Uh, we're going to be looking at the U.S. economy, at inequality, uh, at the world uh, economy and uh, poverty, climate change, <laughs> other topics that are really pressing ethical issues. Up until this point, we've talked to uh, more conceptually 
uh, about uh, <coughs> what is the individual good, uh, what is the public good, what is uh, social justice, uh, what is the uh, role of markets versus government. Every one of these topics and themes is very rich uh, and behind it, it would be uh, an enormous uh, um, depth of inquiry data uh, because all of our topics involve empirical questions. Uh, how do things work? Uh, they involve uh, conceptual questions. How should we measure and characterize phenomena? And they involve uh, ethical questions. Uh, how do we um, describe what is the common good or what is uh, universal rights or what is human dignity? Um, and for all of the topics, I would say uh, time flies in an hour and a half. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, short references are packed into what could be a very long discussion and debate uh, on uh, almost any issue that we're describing. We haven't really had time to talk about, uh, I would say, mainstream economics. I gave a, a little bit of uh, discussion last week about how wages are determined, how supply and demand would affect the income distribution, how technological change would affect uh, the income distribution. But just that topic alone would normally be several weeks of an economics class to go through all the diagrams, the tools, the calculations, the problem sets, uh, and so on. So when we write up this material as a textbook, there will be much more uh, opportunity and time to develop these ideas, to give problem sets, uh, which we haven't done. Uh, so I would say this is what is missing is uh, first more, uh, more of the uh, basics of uh, normal economics teaching. But fortunately, everyone in the class has had some economics uh, coursework before. So you've seen supply and demand and budget sets and uh, probably indifference curves and, and uh, a lot of the things that are talked about, which uh, we're not really with the time to speak about. Laying it out in print, which unfortunately we have been able to do uh, yet, but we're turning this into a textbook, I think will give much more opportunity in future years to uh, give a better balance of the ethical issues, the mechanics, let's say, of uh, economics and the empirical side. And I, I like in economics training to have all three in a balanced way, uh, because I think that those are three different approaches. One is uh, what should we care about? What is the good? Uh, how should we think about solving problems? The second is uh, what are the tools that we have? Uh, and the, the third uh, is uh, what are the data in, in the world? And we've spent relatively little time on the data so far, which is, uh, I, I think, uh, coming up, first of all, in later weeks, but really important for us to get to that. Uh, I know that in most economics classes, there's almost no discussion of real economies uh, in a serious way. Uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, it's, it's really very, very, very poor pedagogy uh, that we have inculcated into us. When you're in it, as I have been, uh, and as you are, it seems kind of normal. You're learning lots of uh, technical knowledge and the idea is, well, you can apply that to economics data at some point, but it's not the emphasis of pedagogy, but it would be like going to medical school and 
never talking about the actual human body, uh, just uh, talking about uh, concepts of how you would study physiology rather than the actual body. But a medical student in the end has to know all 613 bones or whatever, however many there are, and, uh, and all of the different organ systems and so forth. And we don't do that in economics. So this is, uh, these are many weaknesses, uh, Jim, that are part and parcel of, uh, I would say, a, a lack of a proper approach to teaching economics in general. And therefore, we don't have a textbook at hand to grab. And we have a weakness in the course of not having a textbook. Uh, but we will next year. Uh, so uh, you guys are producing a textbook, uh, unbeknownst to you or beknownst to you, but uh, you're making possible the textbook. Uh, and that, I think, will really help on this balance. Um, I'm just reviewing some of the introductory economics textbooks uh, around. You just don't learn about actual economies at all in them. It's just not the point. Maybe a box here and a box there of some human interest story, but not uh, really learning uh, about uh, the empirical side and certainly not learning about the conceptual uh, questioning of the field. I just looked at uh, Mankiw Introductory Economics uh, earlier this morning uh, he was a, he's a friend and a colleague of mine, and it's a 700 page textbook. And there's one page that says, are human beings really like this uh, in the, <laughs> it's, it's literally one page in the table of contents. Do people really decide like this in, you know, in the choice theory chapter? Uh, so <laughs> it's 700 pages, it's, it's one page of question. I, I ordered the book because I want to see whether there's even a paragraph about some of the other things we're talking about. I somehow doubt it. Um, but that, did, that's... Did, Jeff, Jeff, you didn't read the page that followed the one he said. He wrote, and we asked the question, he said, well, the answer is no, so skip the next 650 pages because right. it doesn't mean yeah. anything. Never mind. <laughs> 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 I've got one more if I can. If if anybody has any review questions, go ahead. If not, I'll I'll come up with one more. Please. It's still quiet. Um, there's, there's got to Jeff be some Tony, students with questions here. Jeff go and ahead. Tony, one thing in um, economics courses that I'm long, long ago familiar with um, is the model of the firm is incredibly inappropriate for the world we're in right now. And with the issue of sustainability being present for so many of us, the restraint on even the most moral ethical CEO that is imposed by A, his bonus and the greed that I'm afraid does kind of fit the economic model a little bit, but most of all this stock being in play uh, constantly really restricts how ethically and morally and, and sustainability he can take action. Um, is there anything in your book going to be about the constraint of the reality of the stock being in play for the CEO and, and how corporations are managed and what they can do about sustainability? A ab absolutely. You know, we're going to talk next week about market failure. Uh, so this was, uh, um, we started, I, I mentioned uh, um, this, but we're, actually starting on uh, the topics of uh, externalities, monopoly, and so on, which are in a way standard topics uh, of economics. And I think uh, standard economics can say some interesting things about this, though usually uh, the mainstream doesn't provide enough emphasis about these crucial points. But uh, of course, we know that companies uh, and business activity can do great damage when the company is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing, quote unquote, which is to maximize the shareholder value or to maximize the profits of the company because the 
measurement of profits is very different from the measurement of social good. Uh, and especially when there are issues like pollution that intervene. And the question then arises what to do about that. And the classic answer is that there should be a division of labor. Uh, companies should continue to maximize their profits, but governments in principle should regulate the marketplace uh, for the common good in some appropriate sense so that when businesses pursue their profits, they're also producing, they're pursuing something that is in line with the public good. So that is the standard answer. It's got two great limitations. One is that in our world today, businesses write the laws. They don't just uh, abide by them. So the idea that there is a division of labor where society sets the boundaries and, uh, and, and uh, uh, businesses abide by them is empirically false. Uh, and this is uh, very much evident in the uh, many billions of dollars spent by the corporate sector to lobby legislation and by the fact that a huge amount of our legislation especially the secret clauses put in in the middle of the night in backroom negotiations are literally uh, language from lobbyists that go into the legislation. So this is one uh, point that is obvious uh, why the usual uh, answer is wholly inadequate. A second answer is not everything in this world can be guided by law. Uh, and by contract and by market prices. And so we don't say do any, or generally some people do, but we don't generally say do anything you want in your life as long as it isn't illegal. Uh, generally we say behave yourselves, uh, you know, don't uh, harm your friends, your family, other people, even if it's not illegal, it's not nice. So we have morals uh, to promote, in principle, pro-social attitudes. And companies constantly have opportunities to do damage. E even if the legislation were produced by saints, uh, it would not be produced by efficient machinery to stop all potential damages. So companies need to know in principle, you should not be operating to create more shareholder profit at the cost of others, even if it's legal. And this is a kind of do no harm principle or a pro-social principle. And we believe that more or less, whether we abide by it is another thing, but we believe that more or less with individuals as a measure of moral behavior, uh, morality is not simply a recitation of the criminal code. It is a, a set of principles for living a decent life. And there should be such a code for corporations. And there isn't one. And it's actually even worse than that in practice because there is a, a big debate about corporations which are, uh, businesses that are owned on behalf of shareholders and managers of the corporation manage in principle on behalf of shareholders. And so the question then arises, what is the manager's responsibility to society versus to the shareholder? And I would like to say to the manager, do no harm to others, go make money, but not by damaging others, but rather by producing real social value. But it turns out legally, this is a, actually a contentious idea because most of our corporations are registered in the state of Delaware. And the state of Delaware has a body of corporate law. And there is, are a couple of doctrines that the 
Supreme Court of the state of Delaware uphold. One is favorable to what I just said, which is called the business principle, general business principles that a, that a manager or a board can make decisions on uh, according to general business principles that uh, give it some latitude. So, uh, but on the other hand, the Supreme Court of Delaware has constantly said, it is the duty of the manager to maximize the shareholder's wealth. So some people believe that it's actually uh, illegal to do good uh, in the sense that if you can do something legal to raise profits, you're compelled to do it, even if it would come at the cost of others. You see, this is a really strange idea that uh, not only uh, do you don't even have a choice, you have to do bad to others as long as it raises the shareholder value and is legal to do. And many uh, corporate scholars believe that that is actually the law. Uh, so this is a major challenge uh, that we face and that has led many scholars to believe we need to rewrite the basic charter of corporations fundamentally to say that as a matter of law, the company is has a multi-stakeholder responsibility, not just as a matter of uh, uh, of uh, ethics, but we don't have a corporate ethics in this country that is defined. We don't have a corporate law that is uh, amenable to corporate ethics. And we don't have adequately an understanding of what the common good is in the country anyway, to uh, even get a basic understanding of um, what kind of regulations should be put in place or what does it mean to harm others? We have a lot of uh, leaders in American society that have no concept of harm to others. Uh, Trump didn't care whether he was harming others or whether it was illegal, period. Uh, his rule of life was win uh, and others should lose. So that's really a psychopathic perspective and he was a psychopath but uh, we don't have a deep enough uh, ethics in the United States that is shared even to identify who's a psychopath and who isn't a psychopath uh, and so we have a debate right down the middle of whether this is a great leader or in my opinion a very sick uh, mentally disordered man uh, who happened to become president but um, all of this is to say that uh, uh, this question that uh, um, Jim, that you're raising is a very deep question because as an empirical matter, companies behave very, very badly uh, and often break the law and then pay a small fine afterwards. But the fine is a tiny fraction of the gains that they've earned. So our regulatory system enforcement system is very poor. The laws are written by the lobbies. The uh, corporate ethics is generally oriented around uh, wealth maximization. The law is generally oriented around wealth maximization. And the level of uh, ethical discussion in America these days is uh, rather poor. So we don't even know uh, what we would mean by good versus bad behavior. So adding it all up, it's not surprising we're on a path of wrecking the planet because we can't define these categories uh, clearly enough to uh, even save ourselves from our own behavior. That's what Mankiw talks about on one page of 700. <laughs> so. Uh, if I can ask a follow up. Okay. Uh, let, let me be clear. Uh, uh, let, let me be clear to the class, uh, actually, of a very serious uh, point, which is 
I make a lot of strong statements uh, to share with you my perspective. Uh, you are not bound by my political statements. Uh, you should not take offense from them because they are not a guideline for, uh, for you. They are my kind of pedagogy uh, and they're meant to explain clearly my point of view. Uh, they are not imposed on you. And I, I want to be clear about that in a very serious way. Uh, I like to speak clearly um, and vividly uh, and not to be mushy because it's, I think we at least need to communicate clearly, but I don't want to be offensive uh, to uh, people also in, in the speech, but I do want to be heard and I believe a professor should have a point of view, but not force it uh, on you, but expose it. Uh, it's part of a process of reflecting on these issues for 50 years now. So uh, it's sharing my perspective with you, but uh, do not feel bound by it. It is meant to stimulate your own thinking about these issues. So just to be very clear on that point. I think we had questions from Jack and from Alexios. Uh, yeah, just a follow up question on what uh, James asked. Um, this is also a topic that I'm really interested in right now and I'm, I'm writing my uh, senior thesis about this. Um, and I'm wondering this, this idea that um, it's very sort of Friedman-like uh, idea that, that uh, businesses ought to maximize profits and nothing else and that being reflected in the laws and, and sort of in the general uh, understanding of society that, that um, agents always, you know, need to act in accordance with their principles, um, um, objectives, which are usually to, sh to maximize profits. Does that, does that idea come from our understanding of the market? Like, is the, are the laws that way because we believe the market to work that way and we believe the market to be the, the best mechanism we have for allocating resources uh, in society? And technically speaking, if we would change that narrative, could we also change the laws and sort of all those perce underlying perceptions then? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, Alexios. Uh, oh. The... Um... The Friedman Doctrine was a New York Times op-ed uh, 50 years ago. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether it's on our reading list, but let's make sure that we uh, share it and everybody should read it because it's uh, among the 800 most influential words of, uh, of uh, recent times in economics. Friedman posed the question in a very... Uh, in a very distorted way. And he was a, an effective polemicist uh, and uh, was trying to make a point and he made his point in a phony way, in my opinion. Uh, he ducked all the hard questions and raised only one question. If you read that op-ed, what he's basically saying is, should a manager donate money to his favorite, donate the company's money to his favorite charity. That's the way that he poses the question. Should the company give up some money to do good? And the way that it's phrased is that the manager has some values and wants to use the company's income stream to promote those values. Is that appropriate? And then he answers, no, that's not appropriate because the manager is only an agent of the principals who are the owners, the shareholders of this company. The shareholders may have their values, but they should get that income as dividends and then they can use that income in the way that they see fit. If the real issue we faced with corporations was uh, charitable gifts by corporations, <laughs> we probably would not have dwelled on Friedman's op-ed very much over the last 50 years. And I would not regard the question of who should do corporate philanthropy as a first order important issue. 
Uh, corporate philanthropy, in my view, is a second or third order issue. The first order issue for me is companies doing harm for the benefit of their shareholders. That's a real issue because the world is filled with opportunities basically to take from others. Uh, and you can take from others in a lot of ways. You can pollute uh, and impose uh, external costs. You can engage in financial fraud. You can engage in monopoly power. You can write laws for your own uh, narrow benefit and so on. Companies do all of those things regularly. And so uh, pollution, for example, is the business of the oil and the gas industry. They have known for 40 years internally that they're creating climate change. They have delayed aggressively any action on this during those 40 years. Last week, Exxon said that they would support a carbon price. This is uh, a little late in the day, uh, but it's the kind of debate that we've had for 40 years. That is one nasty company uh, I know from uh, direct personal experience. Utterly irresponsible, in my opinion. So that's one example. Another uh, example is... Um, Martin Shkreli, who went to jail for fraud. Uh, he bought, among other things, he bought a drug uh, that was a generic drug uh, that was selling at a very tiny cost. And he jacked up the cost, I think, a thousand times. And under FDA, Food and Drug Administration regulation, uh, even if it's a generic, you need permission to produce it. And that takes a lot of time. So he saw something that he could buy from a, a kind of a quiet company that was going along doing its business, providing a low cost generic and dramatically ratchet up the price, uh, essentially earning monopoly profits and that it would be years before the FDA and others could react to it. And uh, he's really, uh, obviously, uh, something's really wrong with that uh, person. Uh, and this was quite clear from uh, a lot of uh, profiles of him. But he said, literally, it was my duty to the shareholders to do this, not it was my right to do this, it was my duty to do this. I am but an agent. And my principles would demand nothing less than I use monopoly power to do this. This is obviously, well, I, to my mind, this is a disease of American outlook. Not, uh, and, and I think not too many people sided with him that he had the duty to charge a thousand times the production cost of this life-saving medicine. But that was how it was interpreted. So that was an extreme form. Another example uh, is uh, in the financial crisis in 2008, Goldman Sachs, which I always need to explain is a very distant part of the Sachs family, I assume, uh, because uh, I haven't seen any of <laughs> that wealth in any, in, in any way. Uh, and if I did, I'm sure I would be giving a different lecture anyway. Uh, but uh, Goldman Sachs uh, engaged in financial fraud in 2008. Utter financial fraud. Uh, they conspired with uh, James Paulson, who is a New York hedge fund uh, owner, to sell a toxic uh, bundle of assets to a German bank while Paulson was shorting the transaction so that he would make the counterpart of the German bank's losses. To my mind, it was utterly illegal what they did. Uh, and it ended up with an interesting outcome. First, Goldman Sachs ended up paying a fine 
of several hundred million dollars on this transaction, which was called Abacus II transaction. So you can look it up. They paid a fine, but uh, Paulson never was charged with anything. So Paulson kept $1 billion of this transaction, which I find repulsive. He ended up donating $400 million, I think it was, to Harvard so that the engineering school is named the Paulson Engin Harvard Engineering School now. And I recommended that it be renamed the IKB Bank Engineering School because that was the bank that Paulson stole the money from. Uh, but uh, Harvard was not amused and I didn't mean it as a joke. I meant it as a serious proposal. But uh, when Goldman Sachs never admitted wrongdoing. In fact, uh, uh, Lloyd Blankfein, the CEO, made a statement, quite explicit, very relevant for your thesis, that uh, the other side of the transaction is big boys. They need to take care of themselves. So it's an argument, I can lie if I want. It's not my job not to lie, it's the other side's job to figure it out, which in normal morals is disgusting. Immanuel Kant would have a few thoughts about that. But uh, more than that, I think it's financial fraud, straight out, because that's what financial fraud is about. And we uh, have laws about financial fraud because credit markets are based on credere, to believe, uh, to have faith, to have confidence. Uh, and so you can't have fraud everywhere and still have a working marketplace. So we have laws against financial fraud, but they were not enforced. The reason they were not enforced, in my view, is that the Securities and Exchange Commission is a very weak organization, uh, and they call the uh, legal department uh, of, the, uh, of uh, the SEC, the departure lounge, uh, meaning that the lawyers in the SEC are waiting to be picked up by corporate law firms. So they're like in the departure lounge of the airport waiting to be hired. So they don't wanna go after Paulson or Goldman Sachs. Those are the future employers. Uh, so this is uh, part of the problem. So. Corporations have tremendous power to do wrong. And to go back to your question, uh, Milton Friedman did not talk about that at all. The image that he gave was of a company manager wanting to do good, but it's not his business to do good. It's his business to return dividends to the shareholder. Well, in other words, he ducked the real issue and he never grappled with the real issue. And he does say, I think in that op-ed and he said elsewhere, corporations should obey the law, but he never paid much attention to who writes the law, who enforces the law and the way that the economy really works. So then you can go back and ask, what does this reflect uh, about economics in general? Uh, what, where does this come from, this idea? And it does come from, uh, it comes from an intellectual tradition. So Milton Friedman was writing in the free market tradition. And then one can ask, what is that free market tradition really reflecting? And there are different answers to that question. And we've talked about some of them. One idea is the idea that uh, the free market tradition is the intellectual tradition that champions liberty above all other values. And since liberty is a good in some way, it has a plausibility to it that says, yeah, free market, you get to do your thing. And that is uh, the most charitable view of it. 
And part of the answer that uh, we've tried to give is that taking that view to its logical conclusion leads to a miserable society and a denial of uh, basic human rights and dignity and even survival if you take that to its logical conclusion because people, because the defense of property as the basic point uh, is a denial of other values like uh, survival, justice, equity, and so forth. So that's one part of the, uh, um, the answer. A another part of the answer is the uh, first welfare theorem of economics, which says that a free market out outcome is Pareto efficient. Uh, if uh, a lot of technical uh, conditions and structural conditions are made, uh, that theorem can be proved. But you say, okay, here are conditions A through Z, they lead to the following conclusion that a market economy is Pareto efficient. And then the answer should be, or the question should be, first of all, is Pareto efficiency your ultimate value? And remember, Pareto efficiency just says, ignore the distribution of the outcome, but focus on the question of whether there are any gains from trade that could benefit everybody. So Pareto efficiency is a very narrow, uh, very narrow ethical foundation. Um, and second, conditions A through Z, which are the basis of this theorem, are not true empirically. So on both those grounds, it's a suspicious proposition to begin with. Then there is another tradition, uh, which Friedman was also associated with, with uh, Friedrich Hayek, which says, well, maybe doing good would be better, but governments are evil. And so if you give government too much power, uh, even if it aims to do good, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, and therefore we should not empower government to regulate because you're empowering a beast. And I think this is generally not true. The road to hell is paved with bad intentions more than with good intentions. And the idea that uh, all life is dominated by unintended consequences, I think is false, uh, but it's an easy anti-reform idea that sure, we'd like to do better, but take care because the actual outcome will be worse if you try to do better. That's a standard kind of uh, response. And then the final point I would say is that underpinning all of this is an enormous complacency, which I find a stunning complacency of the economics field. And even though I really like Adam Smith as a thinker and a writer and a humanist in many ways, many strengths, the truth is there is, especially in the wealth of nations, a complacency which he never really, which he invited. And the whole, even though he only says invisible hand once in the wealth of nations, it was a theological doctrine actually in that time that in God's ways, the market is gonna work out well. Uh, and even if they're rich, rich people need to buy a lot of things. So even their wealth gets redistributed to the rest of society. And Smith writes about that fact. And so for him, the invisible hand is not just a, a deeply clever and correct, even ingenious insight about self-organizing systems. It is a measure of moral complacency in a very uh, serious way but it's a, even a metaphysical proposition, I would say, that uh, things will work out well in a market system. 
And that is a real belief that there may be abuses, there may be harms, but in the end, things will work out well. And that's not true, unfortunately, uh, if you're at the bottom of the, uh, the heap. And so my answer to the question uh, of what is Friedman reflecting, he's reflecting many different strands of liberal thought, liberal European liberal thought, which are uh, championing liberty, which are glorifying the market, which are protecting property, which are neglectful of harms uh, and are complacent uh, as a long tradition, going back to Locke, Hume, Smith, Mill, there's a lot of complacency in their writing, uh, which is surprising to me, disappointing. Uh, it's not the anguish, how do we make the world better? It is things will work out okay. And that's, uh, but I think there's also something dishonest in, in Friedman's uh, op-ed actually, which is that he did dishonest or extraordinarily naive though he wasn't so naive uh, that he took the hard issue and turned it into an easy issue uh, for a polemical purpose. He didn't ask, how do we stop companies from doing bad things? Just a question back focused on the midterm. Yeah. Uh, I know we have discussed mostly topics on a conceptual level, but we dealt with um, some formulas in our past lecture. Um, I guess, how much of that should we be expecting? And then I also have something I want to piggyback off of what Alexi said. So um, should I ask that now? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I was just curious, how fundamentally different do you think Friedman's emphasis on maximizing shareholder value is from uh, kind of Larry Fink's business roundtable um, advocating generating uh, long-term value for shareholders. Yeah. So uh, first, on, on, on the first, uh, we, we won't uh, have the formulas uh, for the midterm. Uh, the, the, I don't know, because uh, we didn't really do a sample in the class, but uh, basic calculus is a huge uh, is is a hugely helpful way to uh, solve economics problems, and this has been true since the second half of the nineteenth century, the so-called marginalist revolution. Uh, that uh, that uh, the uh, profit maximization equates marginal revenues and marginal costs. Those are derivative conditions. Uh, if you can take a derivative, uh, you cut through to solve the problem directly. If the derivative is a bit of a mystery, then uh, you uh, have to create tables, spreadsheets, uh, supply and demand curves, and a lot of uh, apparatus. So uh, it, the, the truth is the natural language for a lot of things in economics is uh, basic calculus. Uh, and with it, you could simplify about nine tenths of introductory economics if you could assume that, because a lot of the pedagogy of introductory economics is to avoid calculus. Uh, it's to uh, motivate curves that do the same thing, uh, but without the simple one line or two line uh, solutions. For our purposes, since we didn't canvas anything about uh, the math and haven't done problem sets and all the rest, it won't be on the it won't be on the midterm. Uh, in 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 our book, we'll have to decide what to do about that. Uh, generally, the etiquette is don't put calculus in an introductory textbook. It just lengthens the explanation tenfold, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> And uh, it's the most natural machinery because maximizing a function by setting the derivative equal to zero is so uh, such a good idea 
we're really glad that Leibniz and Newton came up with it uh, in uh, 1660. Uh, it saves a lot of time. <laughs> Um, and that's what all of those equations are about is, is basic derivatives. Uh, if I had more time, I would convince you of that, uh, you know, quite uh, simply. Um, but if you haven't seen calculus, then it's a mess. It looks uh, like a gobbledygook magic. Uh, if you, you know, do know basic calculus, then it's very straightforward. Um, and so, Calculus is actually among the many skills. I think it's a good one uh, to have because uh, a lot of nature uh, works on that basis. So I would uh, encourage uh, that knowledge, but not for the hour exam next week. Um, the, the, uh, the, the Larry Fink business roundtable is uh, a... a it is a reflection of this very debate that we're having, uh, but not a very sophisticated one, I would say. Uh, companies have come to understand that they have to express uh, interest in the well being of different uh, constituencies suppliers, customers, general society, workers. Uh, that they all uh, have to be recognized. Implicitly is the rec implicit in this is the recognition that companies can do very bad things to their workers. They can kill their customers. They can damage society. And it really isn't good for the company to do that. And so part of it is a general sense of do no harm as, uh, and that's fine. And they're, you know, they're, this is what this business roundtable has come to. And in Europe, the discussion is far more normalized around these ideas than here because uh, the US is, has all of those free market libertarian uh, forces at play much more than in Europe. Uh, this is a very much an Anglo-American uh, history of thought, very much an Anglo-American reflection of power, very much an Anglo-American intellectual uh, milieu. Uh, and so in Europe, it's not in continental Europe, Christian thought is much stronger. Catholic social teachings are much stronger. Uh, social democracy is much stronger. And so companies could never have gotten away with Milton Friedman in Europe, except by America's geopolitical influence. Uh, but it would not be homegrown, whereas in Britain and the U.S. it's homegrown. It's also the reflection of the fact that U.S. and Europe, uh, that the U.K. and the U.S. have been the two hegemonic powers of the last 200 years. In other words, the two strongest countries in the world. And this complacency is a complacency of the powerful. So these are American companies, after all, operating in the world. So they should have their way, uh, so, so to speak, according to this ideology. Um, so what has been done is progress, but it's not deep conceptual progress. And it doesn't start from the idea, for example, we have done a lot of harm. We have to stop doing harm. That rhetoric is not in any of these letters. The rhetoric is win-win propositions. Well, win-win is really easy, by the way. That's another soft sell. Uh, because, yeah, if you're going to win, okay, it just says we don't care if others win, too. And th that is kind of Michael Porter, Harvard Business School shared value approach, which I find a very soft idea because again, it doesn't get to the hard issue, which is not harming others. That to my mind is the first test of pro-sociality is not trying to win by harming the other. Then there are other dimensions of pro-sociality even up to altruism in the end. But the first one is don't harm the other, don't take from the other. And so far the business roundtable hasn't dared to issue such a 
heretical thought that maybe they've done something wrong. What they want to say is we love everybody. It's a win-win proposition. It's good for our shareholders if we're nice to our workers. It's good for society. It's good for our reputation. All right, that doesn't really cover Shkreli, Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, Paulson, and countless and uh, Chevron and Exxon Mobil. Uh, so why not take on those issues? Now, uh, a little bit uh, this year, Fink is saying uh, in his letter, um, climate change is really important. That's good. We should orient towards that. Fine, good. It's getting better. Uh, but it's definitely not, uh, I would say, hard-hitting philosophical reflection. Thank you, I appreciate it. It's 11 o'clock, do we have any other questions? This is your chance. Okay, going, going, gone, see you next Tuesday. I'll stick around in case anybody wants to talk to me. Oh, sorry. Um, You're right. It's a, we go to 11.15. I have to get off, though. I apologize. Uh, but uh, I have I'm, to get off at 11. Uh, I will see you on uh, Tuesday, and uh, we can clarify, you know, between uh, now and next Friday on, on the hour exam. And, and, Tony, you'll stay on right now. Yeah, I'll stay on, Jeff. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank you, Professor. Okay, anybody have any any other questions or shall I just talk? <laughs> Anything? I see people are already dropping off. All right, let me um, follow up on something Jeff had talked about then really quickly on um, uh, moral businesses. Uh, I'm gonna, we'll drop something in the in the reading list next week um, uh, for the, the class on market failures, and um, there's a really interesting document called "The Vocation of the Business Leader" that the Vatican put out, and um, it's a short document. And I recommend everybody read it. Read it uh, in conjunction with the Milton Friedman um, op-ed because it's very much the opposite. And what this says is. The purpose of business is threefold, and it's, it's very easy to remember. It's good goods, good work, good wealth. So good goods, good, good, good goods, good work, good wealth. What does good goods mean? Good goods means you produce goods and services. You produce, and this nice slogans here, by the way, goods that are truly good and services that truly serve. So what does that mean? Well, that means... Are you producing something that's of social value um, that contributes to genuine human flourishing in the Aristotelian sense that, you know, in accord with human nature? Or are you producing something that's not really good for the human being, like addictive products or gambling or stuff that doesn't benefit you as a human being? So that's good goods. And then they talk about good work. And that's the prioritization of decent dignified work over profits it's work over profits because the idea that work is about um yes it's about getting a, an income that supports your dignity but work in the catholic tradition and we get more into this later maybe when we talk about work um and the on the on the on the week 10 or whatever it is when we talk about the future of work but work is about more than income it's about meaning, purpose, identity, dignity, all these things. When you see um, what happens to communities when they lose employment, when manufacturing collapses, it's not just that people lose income and they can't spend and their community suffers economically, but people also lose their sense of dignity. They lose their sense of identity. You get all kinds of social and economic problems you get debts of despair where people you know uh, working class or uh, they 
life expectancy is declining due to deaths of despair from things like opioid abuse, suicides, alcohol poisoning, all kinds of stuff like this. And this is, you know, it goes to show you that when you lose dignified work, it's a lot deeper than just losing your income. It's about losing your respect and your dignity and your meaning and your purpose in life. It's very Aristotelian in a sense. It's about the stuff that matters for human flourishing. Um, and this is why good work is, is so important, that it can't be just about maximizing your profits and treating your workers like a, a simple factor of production. Um, and then good wealth uh, in the document, the third, so there's good goods, good work, and good wealth. Good wealth is creating wealth that is sustainable and distributing it justly. So profit, again, is legitimate, but it can't be the only goal or even the sole goal. There's a, a wider sense of responsibility. And here, um, sustainability is really important. Um, consider, um, respect, you know, respect the environment and invest in sustainable development. And this, you know, has a positive and negative dimension. And the negative dimension is as, 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 as Jeff said, do no harm. Um, do not harm the environment from your economic activities. Um, do not create externalities. And we talk about externalities in the class on Tuesday. It's an activity that affects the well-being of the other, but you don't, you don't internalize that. You don't pay for the harm you're causing on the other. Um, so don't, don't harm the environment, but also on the positive dimension, adopt sustainability as something positive. In other words, be part of the solution. If we are moving towards an economy based on sustainable development on decarbonization, um, be part of that. Use your private sector um, creativity and ingenuity to solve these, these, uh, these, these, these hard problems of, of completely transforming our economy. Um, yeah, so this would be, the, that's my five-minute summary of the vocation of the business leader uh, from the Vatican. We will drop it when we, I'll drop it into the readings for next week when I upload a few things. We'll upload Friedman's, uh, though you can Google this yourself, it's pretty easy, uh, Friedman's um, op-ed and also the vocation of the business leader. Again, this is available online for free uh, on, at the Vatican. You can read it online or you can print it out. We'll just Maybe I'll drop in the PDF uh, for you all to, to read. But, um, but yeah, so I see there's a lot of interest in these topics, and that's good, uh, because next week, um, next week um, um, we will talk about market failures. And uh, Jeff, uh, Professor Sachs, will go into a lot of these issues in more detail, how businesses do harm through externalities, through exploiting monopoly power, through... Um, through financial activity that does not benefit the real economy, through producing goods that don't really have much social value, all of these areas where you know businesses are not contributing to the common good and uh, human flourishing. Um, that's kind of what I got for you guys this morning. We're a little bit early, but uh, I see we're down to uh, we're down to nine people. So some people have already dropped off. So that's fine. Um, uh, yeah, James. Um, this is also not exactly on topic for next week's midterm. Um, last summer, you were on the conference of the IAJBS in, um, that was supposed to take place in Guadalajara, but it ended up being virtual, where you proposed a lot of these topics to economists around the world. And every single person said, we can't teach this because if we do, it's no longer economics. Have you had any thinking on that since then of how to, how to marry the two very differing belief systems? Yes, uh, that's, that's right. I mean, I was uh, just to, to explain for everybody else. So I was the, there was this conference on the Jesuit uh, new paradigm in education. Um, and I was uh, leading the discussion on reforming economics education. 
and we discussed some of these ideas and some, not all, but some people pushed back and said, well, if you focus on all of these issues, it's no longer economics as we know it. In other words, they would see economics as Mankiw's textbook or Krugman's textbook or Asimolu's textbook, the, the, the three main uh, principles textbooks that, that seem to be out there right now. Um, but I think that there's a way to do this that, I mean, as you see, we are not, we're not dumbing down economics. Um, when we talked about utility and we talked about um, labor demand, that's probably, we're doing it in a way that's probably more sophisticated than Mankiw is or, or Krugman is for introductory economics. Um, so we're not dumbing it down, but we're trying to teach what's actually relevant. Um, I personally don't think indifference curves. Um, the question to ask is, uh, are you learning in this course what you need to know to, to understand how, you make, how people make economic decisions and how the economy works and how it should work? Um, and I, I personally think by drawing in difference curves, you're not really contributing much to that, that body of knowledge. Whereas I'm hoping that by talking about the, some of the ethical dimensions of this, the conceptual stuff that other courses don't touch, that you're actually touching on some of the deeper problem, the deeper issues that get to how the economy functions, that mainstream economics doesn't really touch on. It doesn't have the tools to touch on. Um, so I think we can marry both approaches, James, in response to your question. We can, we can, be, rig we don't have to, we can be rigorous, but we also don't, we cannot, but we also can be normative in the sense that we're, we're not just talking about how it is, but how it should be and what, what human beings are actually truly like. That's been a big theme for us, as opposed to what this homo economicus, this rational economic person is supposed to think. Uh, and as Jeff said, 699 pages of Mancuse textbooks are on homo economicus, and there's only one page on what human beings are really like, which is very, very peculiar, very peculiar. So I hope that answers the question. And, you know, we're working on it. We'll, the textbook is very much a work in progress. You are the guinea pigs. And when we teach this course again, we'll have a textbook. Um, so the, you, you're, in a, you're in a little tougher situation than the students who will come after you, but that's okay. Um, it's also exciting to be part of a, a new project, I think. And we're learning. We're learning as much as you're learning. We're trying to figure out as we go along how to teach this because it's never been done before. We've never, I've never seen anything like this. Professor Sachs has been doing this since the early 1970s and he's never come across a course taught like this either. So this is all very new and Fordham is actually at the very, at the very forefront of, of this new economic paradigm. Um, so you're a, 